In the year 1903, there were two brothers that set out to try and fly an airplane. Their name was Orville, Orville and Wilbur Wright. They went to a place called Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. They were from Ohio. And as you know, they finally got an airplane up in the air flying a little bit. They sent a telegraph back to their sister, who was still in Ohio. And the telegraph said this, Flew 120 feet, will be home for Christmas. That's what it said. Flew 120 feet, will be home for Christmas. Their sister was very excited about the fact that they had flown an airplane, something they were passionately working on, and she ran down to the local newspaper with this telegraph, and she handed it to the newspaper printer. He took one look at the telegraph that said, flew 120 feet, will be home for Christmas. He looked at the sister and said these, he said this, how nice, the boys are going to be home for Christmas. He totally missed the point. The point was not that they were coming home for Christmas. The point is they flew an airplane 120 feet. I want you to know tonight that's a lot what happens in our culture and our society today. We see the Christmas lights. Oh, I like Christmas lights. I don't like hanging them. That's too much work. I had to do that when I was an assistant pastor. It cured me for ever wanting to hang. I had to hang them on the church. I don't ever want to hang them on my house. I drove down the street, I saw a sign on the side of the street that said, we'll hang Christmas lights. They had a phone number. I, I'm sure they don't do that for free. I'm too much of a cheapskate to pay somebody to do it, and I'm too lazy to do it myself. But I like looking at the other work that other people have done with their Christmas lights. In fact, I might, after church tonight, take my kids and drive around and find some Christmas lights. We enjoy that. I, I like Christmas lights. I know some Christians have a problem with Santa Claus. I know I've heard... You know, it's one letter away from Satan and all that kind of stuff. And I, I respect somebody that would not want Santa Claus at Christmas time. I, I, I get that, but I kind of like Santa Claus. I, I really do. I laugh at the kids that cry in terror as the parents put them on their lap and take pictures and frame them at their house, you know. And I, I remember one time at a Christmas fellowship at our church, a guy dressed up like Santa Claus. I dared my best friend. We were in the third grade. I dared him to pull his beard off. And my friend was dumb enough to do it. It was hilarious. I like Santa Claus. I, 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 I don't mind Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer. I, 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 like, I was going to say I like shopping. I should clarify that. I like internet shopping. I, I don't care for going to the shopping mall personally, but uh, that can get very, very uh, stressful. But I like Christmas cards. I certainly like Christmas food and the, the dinner and the goodies. I certainly love being around my family. But I want you to know that if we look at all of those things and think that that's Christmas, then we're like this newspaper printer that said, oh, how nice, the boys will be home for Chris, uh, Christmas. They, he missed the whole point. And if all we see is lights and tinsel and gifts and Santa Claus and traditions and uh, holiday foods, and, then we miss the whole point. The point is, the big news is that God came to man. And so when we come to the Gospel of Matthew, after giving Jesus His human lineage, that's what verses 1-17 through 17 are all about, after giving His human lineage, Matthew now turns in these verses to give His divine lineage. He's going to say it's, He wants to prove and show that He came from the line of Mary and the line of David in particularly, but now He wants to show that this wasn't just somebody born in the family of David, this is also the very Son of God, God of very gods. And so, it records His birth. I want you to know, in the Bible, there are some pretty spectacular births recorded in the Bible. I won't go through all of them, but one that comes to mind is when Isaac was born. I think we look at that passage and we look at that story, it's pretty fascinating, really, uh, that uh, Isaac was born when both of his parents were pushing right at 100 years of age. And I love the language of Hebrews. We studied that as we've been going through it in Hebrews 11. It says they were as good as dead. Uh, God wanted to make sure that you knew this is, this is not the way it's supposed to happen. And uh, we, we all know that when you're 100 years old, kids is the last thing that you're thinking about, you know? But this was a miraculous birth. But do you know when you come to this passage, the virgin birth surpasses any amazing birth that ever took place in the Bible. Jesus' birth trumps everything. His supernatural birth is really the only way to account for the way he lived. I heard of one time a skeptic uh, was denying the virgin birth, didn't believe the Bible, and 
was talking to somebody that was trying to witness to them, and he pointed at a kid over here, and he said, you mean to tell me that if I told you that uh, that boy over there was born without a human father, he said, would you believe me if I told you that? And the believer looked at this skeptic and said this, he said, yes, I would believe that if he lived the way Jesus lived. Because when you think of that, when you think of all the things that Jesus did in his life, when you think of how he lived, how he conducted himself, the amazing things he did, the way he was able to raise the dead, walk on water, heal the afflicted, the, the way he lived his life, the only way to account for somebody to live such a supernatural life is to say, hey, this is how they were born supernaturally. In fact, Matthew tells us in no uncertain terms. He doesn't mince his words. There's no confusion. You know, there are some people that say, well, you know, the Bible isn't very clear. You know, Jesus didn't really say he was God. His followers just kind of got, got fanatical about it. No, Jesus did, and there was no mixing of the terms. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. And what Matthew is able to do, he gives us some viewpoints that you wouldn't necessarily see in all of the Gospels. You say, why do we have four gospel accounts, four stories, uh, four accounts of the same story? Because they give us four different vantage points. It's the same story, they just give us four different angles. And one of the things that Matthew is able to do is he gives us the vantage point of Joseph. No other gospel really gives that. And you think about Joseph, we don't know a whole lot about who Joseph was. You, you think about Mary, his wife. Now Mary gets a lot of attention. We talk about Mary, or uh, religions worship Mary, pray to Mary, adore Mary. But you know, the truth of the matter is, in the Bible, you don't know a whole lot about Mary. You know even less about Joseph. And here in this chapter, it gives us a little bit of insight about Joseph. And, and I think that's, a, that, that's very important, because while Joseph, we've tried to make emphasis already, Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary and Joseph had not come together physically at this point because he was a supernatural uh, a birth, and we understand, I don't want to get into all the theology of not having sin nature passed down through the Father tonight, but the Bible makes that emphasis and makes that very clear, but, but what I'm trying to say to you is while Joseph was not his literal father, he was his legal father. And, and, and it, it gives us some insight, really, about what God thinks about raising children. I understand that there are some situations where a father isn't present, but you see what God thinks about that. God wanted to make sure that his own son, who was not born of an earthly father, was raised with a father in the home. And while we don't know much about Joseph, we know a few things about him. We know, first of all, he was a carpenter. That's what he did for trade. He kind of a construction worker. He, he was a good man. The Bible calls him just. He was a righteous man. And we'll see a little bit of his integrity and his character here. We know of one account where he took Jesus to the temple to dedicate him and circumcise him like a good Jewish boy would be. He also offered the, the offering that a poor person would offer on behalf of the birth of a son. He took Mary and Jesus to Egypt for protection and then came back to their hometown a couple of years later. He took his family to Jerusalem for the Passover. You remember that time when Jesus was a little bit older and they, they lost him and they didn't know where he was? But it shows us that Joseph was very dedicated to his faith and he was raising Jesus in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But what I would like to say to you tonight, if that's really all we know about him, but just because we don't know much about him doesn't mean that he isn't important to the story. He truly was a remarkable man. Now you think about this, when you were born, when you came into this world, you really had no control over your surroundings. You didn't get to choose who your parents were. You, you had no choice in that. You didn't get to choose where you were born. You didn't get to choose the environment in which you were raised. There are a lot of things that were defined for you. We could say it that way. But I want you to know that as you have gotten older, as I have gotten older, there are things that we have done and things that we have chosen that have, we have done that define us. Whereas when we're first born, we, we have those things that are placed upon us that define us. Then, as we get older, we make choices and decisions, and we have moments in our life that become defining moments, and we even use that expression, oh, that was a defining moment in my life. And a defining moment is an event or, in our life that, that comes to shape who we are. And I think about Joseph as Joseph, he didn't get to choose his lot in life where he was born. He didn't get to choose his parents. He didn't get to choose uh, that. And, and as he grows up, and at this time he's a young man, I would imagine that 
due to Jewish custom, he was probably a very young man, maybe 18 years of age or so, and here he is kind of coming into his own. And in this particular situation, as this is kind of thrust upon him, he reacts in such a way that this whole event becomes a defining moment in his life. And so I'd like to give you this evening three defining moments in Joseph's life. And really, if we kind of examine them, we'll see that we, we might not have been in this circumstance, but we have these experiences sometimes, and they define us. They define us. And so I want to give those to you, three defining moments in Joseph's life. Number one, Joseph's dilemma was a defining moment in his life. Joseph's dilemma. Now, it's very important for you tonight to understand Jewish marriages in the first century. Uh, verse 18 says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. That's very important because it says when they were espoused. Now, I've heard preachers throughout the years, they all see they were, they were engaged. But an espousal in the Bible was a, a, a whole lot more than just an engagement. You know, when you get engaged uh, in our culture today, you know, it's a symbolic idea. The, the man, he goes out and he buys a ring, and hopefully he buys a, a good ring or what he can afford. He really tries to do the best that he can there, and, and uh, you know, he, he plans this out and he maps this out. But I've not known too many men that ask somebody to marry them unless they were, they were I mean, they already knew she was going to say yes. I mean, men have big egos, right? And they can't hardly stand. I mean, there's a few crazy ones out there that'll say, man, I'm going to ask this girl every day until she finally says yes. But most of us, we already know. And we'll do something crazy. We'll, we'll rent a carriage or we'll map out something cheesy or whatever, you know. Uh, mine is a little cheesy, I think, but oh well, we can remember it. I opened up a, a package of M&M's. Because I'm Michael, she's Mindy, and I put the ring in there and glued it back, and I didn't trick her any. She knew it was in there, uh, however, and uh, you know when she got it out, like a Cracker Jack box, I proposed to her, and as you know, she said yes. But I knew she was going to say yes. If she wouldn't say yes, I'd smack her around or something. I'd, no, no, I'm just kidding. But, it, you know, when, when what happens is you put that ring on your finger, she might realize, you know, got caught up in the moment or something. In our culture, she might have said, you know what, this guy's a real bozo. And, by the way, men, aren't you glad she, she didn't say that? It, you know, here's your ring back, or, or I hate to tell you, I pawned your ring, and I'm not marrying you after all. You know what, whatever. The, it's just kind of, you know, that's, we can call it off at any time. But you got to understand, in these days, an engagement and an espousal, two totally different things. Uh, it's not the same concept as what we would understand today. In fact, in those days, it was more of a, an agreement. It, it was less of an agreement or a promise like it is in our day. It was a legal arrangement. And so what you would have is when you became espoused to one another, what would happen is you would have two witnesses, just like uh, we do still today at a marriage, if you... Uh, legally get married, you need to have a witness to the ceremony, and you need to have two witnesses. And so they would have two witnesses on hand because this is a legal arrangement. And as they make this arrangement, oftentimes the, the two that were going to get married weren't even there. Uh, the parents would arrange that. And so they would get together and they would arrange that. And I've often thought, how terrible would that be? And, you know, because the way we're used to it in our culture, could you imagine Mary, most people believe Mary was like 15 or 16 years of age at this time? So could you imagine if you're 16 years of age, you're a sophomore in high school, and you come home, and your mom and dad say, sit down, we got something to tell you. You know Johnny that lives two streets over? Uh, yeah, we, we uh, had a legal document drawn up today. You'll be getting married in one year from today. What? I don't even like him. You know, like, too bad, right? That's kind of the way it worked. And what would happen is the, the groom, the, the, the man's father and mother would pay the... Uh, the wife's parents, a dowry. Now, how would you like that? You know, you're, you're so ugly, they had to, you know, we had to pay you to get married. You know, that's the, kind of the way it worked. But really, the dowry was, what it was, was a compensation for wedding expenses. And it was also a form of insurance in case something went wrong that the family would be compensated if during that time, for some reason, the, 
You, if you read in the Bible, if you read in the Old Testament, sometimes you hear, read this, if, if he doesn't like her, then he can, he can uh, just go ahead and get rid of her. Have you ever read that and that bothered you? Like, wait a second, just because I don't like her, I can divorce her here? Well, it's talking about this period in time because it was such a legal contract that the only way you could get out of it was you had to pay the dowry, you'd lose that money, that insurance, and then, and then also you would have to go through a legal divorce because this was constituted as an actual marriage. It wasn't an agreement, it wasn't an engagement, it was at that point in time, you were married. In fact, any breach in that was considered adultery. And as I already mentioned, you could only dissolve it by actual legal divorce. And so what would happen is during this espousal time, which was usually about a year, and what I understand is for, the, for that year period, you're married to this person, but you really don't have a lot of contact with them. You don't interact with them much, you don't see them much, you're just kind of getting ready. And then after a year, you have a wedding feast, you have a wedding celebration, a wedding ceremony, and we studied some of that when we were studying the parables on Wednesday nights, where they would have a feast, they the lamps, and you remember we the parables of the virgins and their lamps and different things? And then, after about a seven-day party and celebration, they would physically consummate their union, and then they would, they would go, go on about their lives. Now, that enters, at this point, the problem. Here they are, legally married, and some time within that year or so window, the Bible says that Mary, if you, I like the language of the Bible here, it says that she was found, I marked that word in my Bible, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I like the language here, she was found. Now you, you all are kind of understanding this, you can hide a pregnancy for a while, but eventually you will be found out. Right? I, I mean, uh, you, you know, that's just the way it is. And I know you, I know you have to be careful about that. And you, you have to learn that you don't ask ladies when are you due unless you really know they're due. But eventually they get found out. And here Joseph, he's, he's setting up his shop. He's a carpenter. So maybe he's building an addition on the house and he's working and he's saving his money. And, and he begins to hear from people, uh, hey, uh, Joseph, I, I saw... Uh, I saw Mary the other day. Oh, yeah? How's she doing? Uh, she's doing. You had not seen her in a while, have you? Nah, it's been a while. You know, I've been working. I've been building this addition. I've been saving my money. And Okay. Yeah, you might want to go see how she's doing. Why? What's up? Ah, just uh, never mind. You know? and, and, and he's hearing this. He's hearing people talk. He's hearing rumors. And, and then he sees her and he says, oh, no. Oh, no. He knows that this isn't my child. He knows that this is my wife, but that's not my child. He knows he's got a serious problem. Maybe this is kind of like what the Bible says in Proverbs 12 and verse 4. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness to his bones. Oh man, you could see him while he was sanding cabinets and building additions. He, he thought of Mary and her virtue, and she was as a crown to his head. He loved her. He adored her. The Bible says that he was a just man, and I found that usually birds of a feather flock together. And him being a just man, he believed that he had found a just woman. And man, he was so thrilled and so happy and so excited about their upcoming life together. But then he hears that she is with child, and it's not my child. And all this virtue that he had seen in her, all this goodness that he had adored in her, now he is ashamed of her and it is as rottenness to his bones. He couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. But I asked the question tonight, what couldn't he believe? I think there's a lot to this story he couldn't believe. I think first of all, he couldn't believe that a girl as pure and as good as Mary was could have done something like that. I think... When he confronts her about it, she says, hey, listen, I know this sounds crazy, but I haven't been with anybody. I'm still pure and I'm a virgin. This, this is of the Holy Ghost. You think he's believing that? That sounds like the craziest story in the world. No, 
He can't believe that she would do something like this. Then he can't believe this far-fetched tale that she's telling. And then he can't believe that this is happening to me. What did I do? How could I let this happen? I'm a good person. I try to obey the Lord and follow Him, and this is happening to me. There's a lot about this story he just couldn't believe. You see, this dilemma that he had was one that we all must face sometime in our life. You say, what do you mean? Here he is, he's looking at Mary, and even though she has failed in his mind, at this point in time, he doesn't know what to believe, and you can see in the Bible that he doesn't really believe her story. He doesn't believe that she's a virgin and has conceived of the Holy Ghost. He doesn't believe that. But do you see what he said? He said, it says there that he's a just man. So that means he's saying to himself, you know what, I, I can't marry her. I, I can't go along with this. She's been impure. She's been immoral. And, and the law grants in this that she has been adulterous. And, 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 and that, that gets me out of this obligation legally. And, and really the Bible prescribes that she is to be publicly shamed and even killed for her immorality. So he's a just man. He says, I'm not going to be a participant in this immorality. But you'll see, not only was he a just man, he was also a compassionate man. He said, but you know what? As much as this hurts me and this grieves me, I still love her and think a lot of her. I don't want to publicly shame her. I don't want to tarnish her, her character and her reputation any more than it already is. And I, I certainly don't want to see her, her murdered and killed and judged for her sin. I, I don't want that. And so he has this, this dilemma in his life of choosing between law and love. The law demanded her to be shamed and even killed, but he loved her. And so he had this dilemma going on in his mind between conviction and compassion. And I want you to know in your life, that's a defining moment for you when you have to struggle with and wrestle with conviction and compassion. I want you to notice what he ultimately chose to do. He chose to side with conviction. It says there, I'm going to put her away. I'm going to divorce her. I'm going to put her away. And, and by the way, if I could just give you this side note, and I, I know we have everybody in here tonight, but I, I want to just emphasize again what the Bible says. The Bible puts a high value and premium on sexual abstinence before marriage and sexual faithfulness within marriage. The Bible goes over and over and over again this, and I know our society has gone so far away from this stuff, but in the house of God tonight, we need to recognize and teach our children and teach our young people and teach our families that God, no matter what our culture and our society has skewed itself and begun doing and how perverted and, and far away from, from the, the purity of the Bible has gone, God still places a high premium on sexual abstinence before marriage and sexual fidelity within marriage, you still see that. And I'm thankful that Joseph, in this context, he said, you know what? I'm going to side with my convictions. I'm going to side with what is right. But I want you to notice what else he chose. Not only did he choose conviction, he still chose compassion. It says he put her away privily. It was a dilemma. It was a problem. But it came to define his character. I, I'd like to say to you tonight, it's not an uncommon experience for people who obey God to have problems that seem to mock the ways of God. You say, what do you mean by that? Here is Joseph trying to do the right thing. And he's in, he's in a conundrum, a dilemma, a problem, and he's trying to do the right thing. And I can see people kind of mocking him. Ah, Mr. Religious Joe, you know, Joe Spiritual over there, literally. And here he is, you think you're Mr. Righteous and you serve God and look what you get. You try and do it the right way and look what happens to you. You try and serve God and this happens to you. And You know, the world does this all the time. They look at people trying to do what's right and living and you're, you're abstaining from this and you're going to this and you're doing that and all, you, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your life and, and it seems like you're serving God but you got problems and you got this going on. But I want you to know about, about uh, Joseph. Here's what happened to him in his trial because anytime people of faith like you and like me go through a trial, any trial in life is going to answer the following questions. And people are watching you like they were watching Joseph. 
Are they going to continue to believe God even though by obeying Him it brought problems instead of blessings? Because let's be honest here tonight, we're not trying to be some televangelist that tells you anytime you serve God, you're just going to, going to succeed and everything's going to be perfect and smooth sailing. That is unbiblical and it's unrealistic. By the way, there are a lot of false prophets today. That, a couple weeks ago, I, I couldn't sleep. I was up in the middle of the night and I, and I actually watched Joel Osteen for as long as I could handle it. Amen. I watched him for 10 minutes. And, and, and literally, I'm not kidding you, he, he told the congregation, I'm looking at this auditorium, thousands, tens of thousands of people sitting out there. He said, he, he was talking about how, how, great it is, how great they are and they just got to think positive. And he literally told them, take out your checkbooks and look at your checkbook and tell your checkbook that you are going to be victorious. Listen, I'm going to tell you, some of you can look at your checkbook and tell it you're going to be victorious all you want. It's not going to make more money jump into your account. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, you, you negative preacher. I'm sorry. Do you know sometimes by obeying God, by obeying God sometimes, I've gotten into trouble. Not, not sin trouble. I'm just talking about problem trouble. You know, sometimes I've told the truth and it made people as mad as a hornet. I mean, wanted to, wanted to fight you. Hate your guts, won't shake your hand, won't look at you. I mean, if looks could kill, you'd be dead ten times. Well, that's what I get for doing what's right, huh? You know, there have been times that I've obeyed the impulses of the Lord and it's hurt me financially. What, 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 what's going to happen in your life when other people are watching you and they say, by serving God, you got yourself into trouble? I wonder if they're going to keep obeying him. Yeah, I'm sure. Joseph gave us a great example of that. How about this? It answers the question, will they stop following God because his way caused some suffering? I, I just want to give you this and we need to move on, but those that are called to great privileges and blessings are not exempt from problems. Joseph is a great example of that. In fact, I would like to tell you tonight, sometimes if God has called you to great privilege and blessing, Sometimes what it does is it might even increase your problems. Because the Bible says this, before honor is humility. Joseph's dilemma became a defining moment in his life. He didn't ask for the trouble. He was just trying to do what was right. But you know what? Most people believe Joseph died early in life because we know that Jesus was only 33 years of age when he died on the cross somewhere approximately there. And we know that Joseph wasn't in the picture. And Jesus said to John, take care of my mother, take care of Mary when I'm gone. And so we, we typically understand that Joseph had died. But in his relatively short life, maybe died some, somewhere around in his 50s, I could imagine at 50 years of age, he looked back in his life and he said, you know what, I didn't ask for that trouble. I didn't ask for those problems, but I'm so glad that that problem came. Because that day when I heard that Mary was expecting a child, oh, I remember the distraught feeling, and I remember the angst, and I remember the, 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 the tension in the pool. But I also look back now these some 30 years later, and I look and say, that was a defining moment in my life. And it began to it came about and defined my character in such a way that it caused me to be a balanced man, that balance between conviction and compassion, and it caused me to come forth shining as gold because I was going to trust the Lord no matter what difficulty it brought in my life. So I must hasten, number two, Joseph's dream was a defining moment in his life. I want you to notice, and I do believe I need to hurry, but the Bible says this, but while he thought on these things, and then that sounds silly to say. While he thought, I bet that's the only thing he could think of. I bet when he woke up, he thought about Mary and thought about what was going on. I, I think as he was working, he was sanding wood, he, he thought about Mary. I think while he was doing business with people, he was distracted and he was thinking about other things. I think when he was tossing and turning, trying to go to sleep, that's what he was thinking about. I think while he was asleep in his dreams, that's what he was thinking. I think when he went to the synagogue and he was sitting there and there was teaching going on, he was thinking about this. That's all he ever did think about. 
He had thought this whole situation through and through and through again. I like what Matthew Henry, the commentator, said, those that would have direction from God must think on things themselves. It is the thoughtful, not the unthinking, whom God will guide. So Joseph, in his own mind, he thought it through the best that he could. He said, here's what I'll do is I'll put her away, but I'll do it privately. And that's when God stepped in. I want to encourage you tonight that that teaches us a great spiritual lesson that we cannot expect God to work hard to solve our problems if we are not working hard to solve our problems. The old adage, God helps those that help themselves, I understand that that's not in the Bible and that's not entirely true because when it comes to salvation, God helps those who cannot help themselves. But I will tell you this much, that there is some truth in that, that we cannot expect God to work out our problems if we are not doing all we can to work them out as well. And I have found that when you do everything you can, when you are thinking, when you are pursuing, when you are trying, when you are attempting, it is then that God will step in and help. And Joseph here, he thinks it through, and he's got a plan, and it's then that God comes in, in the form of a dream, and he reveals the circumstances and the character of this child. He says in verse 21, it's the Savior. We've already pointed out that Jesus was a common name, but God takes the ordinary and makes it very extraordinary. And he tells Joseph that this baby, who you will call Jesus, is literally going to do what his name means. He is going to save his people from their sins. He says in verse 22 that this child is God with us. And he quotes Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. It's quite possible that Joseph is very familiar with that passage. It's quite possible that Joseph heard that taught in the synagogue recently. Maybe he was even meditating on that name, on that, on that verse. Maybe he was thinking about how Mary said, listen, I'm telling you, I've not been with a man. This child that is in me is conceived of the Holy Ghost and is a virgin. I wouldn't believe it myself, but an angel came to me. I can't believe this is that. And maybe Joseph is thinking, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. But you know, the Bible does say in Isaiah, Isaiah 7 and 14, that a virgin shall conceive. The Messiah is going to come in the form, uh, uh, come as a man, born of a virgin. Maybe, just maybe, this is it. And it is then that Joseph is met by an angel in a dream who tells him, hey, it's true. It's true. And it was at that point in time that dream became a defining moment in his life. Why? Because I want you to see thirdly. Joseph's decision was a defining moment in his life. I want you to look at verse 24. Then Joseph being raised from sleep, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, mark this word, did. Did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. I tell you, I hold Joseph in the highest regard. He just, okay God, if that's what you said, then that's what I'll do. He didn't argue, he didn't doubt, he didn't fret, he didn't think of something else to do, he just did what God said to do. And you know the truth of the matter is, as we look at that and we celebrate him, we say, oh, what a man of character, what a man of integrity. Wow, look, he just did what God told him to do. But do you know by doing what God told him to do, for the rest of his life, Joseph still lived under the cloud of public scrutiny and shame. So what do you mean by that? Well, he married a woman who was thought commonly among other men in their culture and their society to be a fornicator you say how do you know that because even when jesus was a man they still accused him of this. remember that time they said well we know who our father is they were saying to jesus we all know what happened in your life we all know that joseph raised you but there's doubt as if it, you, they, they questioned him he lived under that he raised a child who was thought to not be his own but I love this about Joseph. His decision was to do what's right, no matter the cost. He wanted to do God's will, even if he was criticized or if he was misunderstood. And I tell you tonight, that's encouraging because we all struggle with doing God's will. And the reason for that is because we have a will of our own. We want to do what we want to do. We want to do what we think is better. We want to do what we think uh, uh, would make more sense to us. But Joseph just said, hey, if this is God's will, then I will do it, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it's difficult, even if the results aren't what I want them to be, I will do what God wants me to do. Joseph was around today. Maybe he would sing with us, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. 
you see Joseph's decision. He just did what God told him to do. No questions asked. No reservations. No turning back. It was a defining moment in his life. Could you imagine if Joseph would have looked at this angel or he would have awakened and he would have said, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Uh, do I, you know, I've had some weird dreams before. Those are real bizarre dreams. Maybe that was one of them. Uh, maybe I wasn't thinking clearly. You, you ever done that? You've woken up for a dream and you remember parts of it and it's real hazy. You're not sure you got it all down. Maybe that's what he's thinking. Like, maybe I don't remember the whole thing. Maybe it was just some indigestion. Maybe it was that pizza I ate before I went to bed. You know, I, no, he got up and he did it. And that became a defining moment in his life. Now you think about it, it could have defined him the other way. He could have questioned, he could have resisted, he could have refused. And you know what? That would have defined his life in an entirely different way. What I'm telling you tonight is that you're going to have dilemmas that come in your life. And how you respond to them is going to define your character. You may not have a dream from the Lord. The revelation of God is complete. But I'm going to tell you, you've got a revelation from the Lord, a Bible, 66 books, 1,189 chapters. And they are, they are right there in front of you. And how you respond to what God says to you in that book is going to define your life. You know, you're going to have to make some decisions, some tough decisions in your life. Whether or not you're going to obey God or not. And your obedience is going to define who you are. What moments in your life have defined you and revealed your character? Have your problems and dilemma, dilemmas solidified your character or have they shaken it? Are you doing the best you can do? And you're waiting on God to do what you cannot are you determined to do His will, whatever the cost? I want God to have confidence in me like He had confidence in Joseph and know that these moments are going to define who He is. And He's a just man, a good man. And I've, call, I've called Him to do a hard thing, but a great thing. I thank God for Joseph. I thank God for these defining moments in his life.